Welcome to the All Outdoors Photography Podcast. This podcast is about all things outdoor photography, including landscapes, wildlife, macro, and more. The show features two talented photographers, Henry Doyle and Ryan Taylor, who bring their different experiences in photography to the podcast. The show is released weekly every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so I hope you sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. On today's episode, Henry and Ryan talk about photographing what's close to home, your backyard. They discuss the importance of practicing your craft wherever you can, the various birds and blooms you may see, and how to attract any species to feed and nest in your yard or surrounding area. Make the most of the land and the space you have, and the wildlife and plants will follow. As always, be sure to follow us on Instagram at All Outdoors Photography Podcast. And now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Yeah, it'll it'll, keep, it'll pick it up. All right, one, two, three. Perfect. Okay. All okay, good. Cool. Yep. Welcome back to episode thirty-six of the All Outdoors Photography Podcast, and today we're going somewhere close to home <laughs> we are going to our backyard so to speak yes. um, we're going to be talking about uh all things backyard photography and um, yeah i'm really looking forward to this episode it should be a fun one yeah it's it's something people tend to overlook like backyards are very underrated um i think as you get more professional maybe like you start to lose appreciation for it but it, it can be really beneficial i think yeah, definitely. I feel like, um, at least in my case, a lot of my earliest like exposures to photography were in my backyard, just taking photos of the birds back there and just little, just, I don't know, landscapes, little flowers or weeds that would grow back there. And, um, you know, as you get kind of mature in your process, you almost forget about it, so to speak. And uh-huh. so I feel like it's good to go back to it and turn to it every now and then and see, you know, just everything change. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, like, why do you think it is important to continue to go back to your backyard? Um, it's, man, it's a couple of things, I would say. It's just because it's so close to home um, that we said. It's like you, you kind of forget about it because you want to travel to, the, like, the far-flung locations and everything. But um, it's kind of like the easiness and the access of it um, overall, really. Um, it's just always there for you. Um, it's easy as you can just go out in your backyard pretty much whenever you can and you know, if you don't want to drive off hours away or even down the road, you know, it's always there for you, which is cool. Um, and I found that it's like for a lot of the uh, common year round birds that, you know, would visit bird feeders like I do in my backyard that we'll talk about maybe later is that it's neat to see like just the behavior and stuff that you can see just right from your window even, which is neat. Um, and yeah, just kind of just seeing the way the landscape changes and um, all throughout the seasons, like the trees you may have in your backyard, just seeing how the leaves and if they, they bear fruits or berries or just anything, you know, like there's just a lot out there to see that, you know, you don't have to travel to, which I think is important. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with everything you're saying. I think another big part of backyard photography is practice, too. Um, of course, in the mm-hmm. early days, always being out there. But even today, you can go outside and practice camera techniques, pack, maybe practice your autofocus settings for wildlife. So you don't miss a shot out in the field, you know, you can practice in your backyard um, or just kind of practice your workflow, like bring your camera bag out there and I don't know, test some filters or whatever you need. I mean, it's a good place to experiment um, and you can get great photos. Definitely. Um, I know I still do to this day, especially birds, you know, cause you know, it's such a small scene that you won't see the houses around you. It's just the bird. So um, I really like my backyard. I, I definitely lost appreciation for it for a long time, but I've kind of rediscovered it um, the past couple months, and I, I go out pretty often now. Just like if I have some free time, you know, I don't have time to go out in the field, but I'll just go to my backyard and shoot some stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'd agree with that. It's definitely like a practicing field for, um, like you said, like birds and everything that you may see. And you might see those everywhere else that you may go, like if you go on big hikes and everything, of course, but... You know, it's just neat to kind of say, like, hey, I took this amazing shot of this, I don't know, like a morning dove or something in your backyard. You know, just like, wow, you can just see them back there. I'm like, yeah, if you just bring up food, water, um, maybe even nesting, like a like a habitat that would sustain that sort of thing. Like, yeah, you can bring these birds or any kind of wildlife really to your yard. Uh-huh. Squirrels. Uh, that's a big thing. I mean... <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's, there's just so much out there. I know we keep mentioning birds because uh-huh. it's. 
at least for probably both of us, is the biggest one. But yeah, there's so much out there uh -huh. in general, mammals yeah. of all kinds. I get, uh, there's a family of hawks that always fly above our house, so that's always fun. <laughs> Do they live nearby? Yeah, they live they live in the nearby park, but they're always up in the trees. I've got like in my yard, um, or in my neighbor's yard, I've got like massive trees. Um, they're like a hmm. hundred feet tall at least. Like they're huge. Like, uh, so you always get a bunch of uh, raptors up in those branches. So it's really fun. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, it, it, I think the neatest thing about backyards in general is just that. Um, everyone has their own different unique one to themselves. Like it's mm -hmm. just the habitat, the way the trees you may have and just, yeah, things like that happening where you get these nesting hawks. Like that, that's pretty cool. And um, I, I really don't get that around here in my little suburban backyard, but um, it's a decent amount size. And like um, I have a nest box uh, propped up for Eastern bluebirds and oh, cool. for the past, I think three years now in counting, like right now, actually in spring, um, there is a four eggs in there already. So I'm hoping they have at least one or two broods of uh, bluebirds that'd be awesome wow. so it's just neat to see that that yeah the habitat kind of um just making the most of what you have i guess that, that's kind of like the moral of the story for this episode yeah and you could you could hang up a bird feeder as well and attract a whole variety of species really like you could see goldfinches mm -hmm. uh like house finches a lot of finches uh, <laughs> doves you know Definitely. just tons of things will come to the bird feeder mm-hmm yeah, and it's, it's neat because I'm still seeing, like, new species. Like, um, I think a couple weeks ago, um, I saw a northern flicker, which is, like, oh, wow. pretty cool, I think. It's a, it's a common bird, like, so to speak, a common woodpecker, but that was the first time I ever seen one in my backyard, and it was just hanging off a suet cage and nibbling on it. And I was just like, that is so cool to see wow. that. Um, yeah, and then a few days later, a pileated woodpecker uh, mm -hmm. was kind of just hanging out for a day or two, which is awesome. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, it's just neat to see. Um, these birds just up close and personal. Like if you're in the woods somewhere, it'd be harder to see, like especially like a pileated woodpecker, I'd say. But like they just come out in plain sight every once in a while and visit. You know, as long uh, as you pay attention to what's out there. And they're definitely more domesticated too, so they they have less. Um, they're less scared of humans generally, so you could get a little bit closer. Yeah, I, I feel like when in like a feeding setup, um, like the one I'm actually looking at right now out in my backyard, um, it's kind of just meant to be. Like when I would say most wildlife really, but like especially birds when they feed, it's they kind of enter the state of vulnerability because you know they're focused on feeding, of course. Um, so yeah, you do get these really up close looks, and that can reward you also with great photographs as well. Just neat. Yeah, definitely. You can really set up some close ups that you may not be able to set up elsewhere. I think so. Yeah, and like obviously the the show here is about photography itself, but yeah, it's just neat how you can kind of create this almost artificial kind of setup, I guess, you know, where uh -huh. you, can, you can make your backyard in a way. So that's, um, I guess, photogenically speaking, like suited towards your, you know, your gear, I guess, your telephoto lens and all that yeah. stuff. So you could, you could even, um, I'm not sure if you've done this, but I've kind of tried this a little bit to not really much success, honestly, but you could lay out some like large, fairly large dead twigs and create like natural purchase for birds and land oh, yeah. like, next to your bird feeders. I've wanted to do that. I haven't got the time yet, but that'd be really fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I've tried it and, um, you know, I just keep a close eye on it for a week or two and I really have not had much luck, but um, maybe I'm just doing it wrong. Uh -huh. But um, yeah, maybe next time if you're, you know, cutting down some tree limbs and have some decent size stuff, maybe just lay next to some bird feeders yeah. and they, they may perch on it. And if you're stake out the position, you may get some great shots, I think. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, I'll do something similar, like, uh, by the bird feeder, I'll wait in, like, a, a bush. It's not really in a bush, but, like, it's a laurel bush, so I can kind of, it's it's a massive bush, so I can, like, kind of crouch down and be camouflaged, and I could get some great shots of birds on tree, or on limbs, like, kind of around the feeder. Uh, so that's <laughs> one of the common places I'll go to. Um, I saw a tanager, actually, doing that a couple weeks ago. Hmm. I, my camera didn't focus, of course, but uh, still, it was great great to observe the tanager um, and probably would not have flown in if I wasn't hidden as I was. So, Was it a scarlet or a summer tanager? It was a scarlet, so pretty cool. Oh, okay, yeah. That'd be one of those moments because uh, every time I see like a scarlet tanager, I'm like, is that a cardinal? I don't think so. <laughs> I look through binoculars or telephoto and I get so excited. Yeah, it's a, it's awesome that bird. was a lifer for me, so. Oh, yeah, sweet. Uh -huh. Congrats. 
Yeah, it's just, I think it's just like those black wing bars, the streaks, they give it away. Yeah. But um, it's so easy from a distance to be and like, it's, is that a cardinal? It's kind of a slightly different shade, too. Like it's, yeah, it's like a brighter scarlet, yeah. I'd say. It's more vibrant. Almost orange, like, but not, not quite. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think um, I think the Scarlet Tanger, uh, the females, I think they're like kind of a yellow orange uh -huh. gold, if I'm correct. Oh yeah, I think I saw. Um, a or I might, I might yeah. be thinking of Summer Tanger females, or maybe both. Um, <laughs> yeah, but they're obviously like a much duller color compared uh -huh. to the males, like most birds. Yeah. But, um, I mean, yeah. Um, what would just... you say? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I was just gonna ask, like, what would you say is the rarest bird you ever see in your backyard? Oh, good, great question. Um, no, okay. I'm gonna answer. I'm gonna answer, but not really. I'm gonna have two answers. Okay. Um, just because I'm thinking of something. But like during spring and summer, especially, um, if you put up hummingbird feeders, um, Ohio only has one species regularly. I would say, um, and that's the ruby throated hummingbird. And huh. um, I a couple of years ago when I really got into you know nature and photography in general, like because I you know just kind of designed my backyard to be this big <laughs> haven, I guess, for things to see. <laughs> Um, and photograph, of course. Um, so I put out some hummingbird feeders, and yeah, so that's that's a species that I'm always, like always excited to see because it's kind of like one. It just comes and goes because it's just such a fast moving bird. Um, but anytime I've seen them out there, like maybe I'll just be sitting outside reading a book on the patio, and I hear this little buzzing sound, and I just see one right in front of me, like a couple feet away, because you know they're not they're not a shy bird by any means. Um, so that, that's one bird that like. Um, every seldomly I'll say it probably visits daily, but I'm just saying like anytime I'm actually like looking out there or out there in general, um, it's kind of hard to see, I guess, because uh, uh -huh. they are so small and fast. So um, what I'm getting at is like that's a cool bird every time I do see one, just because it I would say it's pretty special every time I see one. Yeah, it makes me smile. But um, I would say the like not not necessarily the rarest, but like the most I don't know how to say it, uncommon bird um, would be a rose-breasted grosbeak. Um, that, that's a that's a gross beak like a northern cardinal same family of birds um, and it's a more special one i'll say because it's usually seen during like spring migration um, and then this year and last year in may um, i've actually had one a male one at that um, visit my feeders and it'll visit for a couple days i'm not sure if it's the same one but i'm just going to assume it is and um, yeah i'll just visit my feeders which it sticks out like a sore thumb uh, compared to any other bird species around here so uh -huh. every time i see it i get really excited so it's a cool bird. It's a cool uh, backyard kind of bird, I would say. Cool. Yeah, that's that's awesome that you can attract those kind of birds. Yeah, and it's like I'm not even changing up my seed or anything. I'm pretty consistent, um, which we can talk about that later in detail. But, like, I'm just using the same stuff I use practically all year. I don't really switch up things just to uh -huh. keep everything nice and, yeah, consistent. So yeah. it's pretty neat, and it just shows up anyways on its own. I'm not sure how it finds, finds this stuff, but uh -huh. it does. How about you? Um, well, I'm trying to think. I've definitely seen hummingbirds. Um, so my, my mom is a big bird person as well. Um, she actually studied ornithology in college as a minor. Oh, wow. So she, like, has the bird feeder set up and whatnot. Um, so she is a hummingbird feeder, uh, or at least last year she had one up. Um, so I've never gotten a shot of one, uh, but I have seen them a lot, and, you know, I'm kind of copying you, but you know they're they're great birds, and uh, uh, there's nothing like seeing the buzzing of their wings, and it's really cool to observe. Um, I will I will say I've never tried photographing them at least yet because they are just so tricky. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's besides the point. I don't know, you would have to use like one four thousandth of a second or something to freeze oh, yeah. that. It's and like crazy. A, and like a flash because uh -huh. they would just look so. Ugh. Yeah. Without it, I think, in that case. <laughs> with with my it. F11 lens, I don't think I'd be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You need the widest out of tree you can get. Yeah. I got to <laughs> bring out my video out lights tree. outside and just set them up. <laughs> hey, that's an idea. Yeah. yeah. Set up strobes on both ends or whatever, uh -huh. the feeder. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, but probably, I don't know if this is rare at all. I'm not the best at burning. But uh, a couple months ago, I think it was February. Um, I saw a, let's, it's a white crown sparrow, I think. It's the yellow, uh, it, it's the yellow sparrow with a crown. Uh, white-throated, I believe. White-throated, yes, white-throated sparrow. Uh, I have no idea if that's rare, but it was rare for me. Uh, First time I'd seen it, and it was really cool. And it just landed right by the bird feeder 
um, on this beautiful tree and it was nice background separation and it was just a I got a great picture and it was a great bird to observe so it's probably my favorite that's awesome yeah that, that, that's honestly one of my favorite birds just because um, for the bird song alone it's just so like cheery sounding uh -huh. especially um, we get them in Ohio like probably most of the Midwest like during the winter especially it's when they're yeah like most prevalent and so like you know you're out there on a bright frosty morning and you just hear that oh can song and it just uh -huh. puts a smile on my face always so, yeah that, that's an awesome bird and also like in winter you don't get a lot of brightly colored birds so it's nice that it's a mm -hmm. nice break like it's kind of a i thought it was a warbler back then because i was you know <laughs> i was still kind of new and i'm still learning but uh it's kind of like a, a preview of spring migration i guess that's how i see it at least <laughs> oh man yeah, I mean, it, it's the great sparrow, I mean, uh, overall, but um, it, it's fairly common, I will say, but like for backyard, um, at least in my experience, that, that's pretty special find, uh, I'd say. And then there's, uh, I was going to also add goldfinch as well. They're also not rare, but, you know, they're beautiful birds. It's probably, I would say the goldfish is, goldfish, sorry, I would say the goldfinch <laughs> is my favorite bird, uh, favorite songbird, at least. I've always loved it, so uh, I always love oh, yeah. watching them and photographing them. Yeah, it's neat seeing their like plumage vary um, oh, yeah. over the season, it's of crazy. course, because you know, it's obviously it's more dull, especially well for the males mainly, but like it's more dull obviously in uh, winter for them. Uh -huh. You know, it just hits spring and you just get that vibrant golden color. That's really neat. And for a common like bird, like most people think of the bright, colorful stuff as like like a warbler or something, and like a goldfinch. It's really not. It's a pretty common bird, but like it gets that colorfulness too. Yeah, it's it's one of those. People, like people think it's rarer than it is like you said because of the color but it's definitely I, it's just great i don't know i love the goldfish yeah no i don't blame you it's, it's a yeah. good one too yeah so the color really doesn't matter yeah so i was gonna ask um do you have any like nesting birds that like will come back year to year and make a nest in a certain spot have you ever experienced that or um yeah, just the bluebirds, like I mentioned. Uh -huh. um, I say that's a, that's the main one. Um, and actually, I'll give you a little live update. But I just saw a squirrel <laughs> just a little bit ago while you're speaking. Was um, just looking at kind of like the nest box and everything. And I got I got like a a baffle on it, so it should deter them or any predators for that matter. But he was looking up, and instantly I saw the male bluebird go down, and he was like pecking at him and doing all these like loops, trying to like drive him away. And it was pretty cool. <laughs> wow. I don't know. It's pretty wild, yeah, yeah to see that. Are, and like, yeah, it's fun watching them for sure. I think he's just clueless. I'm not sure if he's really out to like harm like the the eggs, I guess. But like, he was just like, looking up at it, and like instantly a bluebird out of nowhere, the male one at least, like just swooped down and started pecking at him. Yeah, I don't, these, like, I don't think like, squirrels are after the people. eggs, definitely. But yeah, it's mainly like raccoons and feral cats uh -huh. and or any cats really. But um, anyways, <laughs> I'm gonna be on tangents now because I keep looking out my backyard actually. But um. So, um, yeah, to answer your question, um, it's mainly the bluebirds, which is obviously awesome because that's a, that's a species in past decades that, you know, it's been, it's kind of seen a resurgence really, uh, much like the bald eagle or Californian condor, just, you know, birds that really came back population wise, um, and the Easter bluebirds, no exception as well. Um, I'm trying to think mainly just every once in a while, I'll see my front yard, like a American robin nest. Yeah. Um, just hanging out or I'll see it in like a neighbor's yard um, above their storm drain or something. Like they actually build it up there, which is crazy. Um, other than that, it's pretty much it though. I mean, just, I'll find those nests every once in a while, um, but it's mainly the nest box that I have just one of them um, put up. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have like that nest box just... like hung like on your house or do you have it like in the middle of your yard, like on a stake or something oh. or yeah um i guess yeah bluebird nesting 101 um i would never recommend you put it on your house okay. or a tree um much in the same way i just um i guess i just observed really is that you know predators can easily climb a oh, tree okay um snakes depending on where you live not really my problem here um i have seen garter snakes but like which aren't really that crazy you know dangerous i guess but um if you live out in like rural ohio or anywhere really in the midwest um don't have it like on trees or stuff because obviously snakes can <laughs> slit up trees and everything, of course. And um, and yeah, much in the same way as like feral cats or any kind of like raccoons or any any curious little critters, I guess overall. Um, 
So I would recommend against that. Um, mine's on a little, it's like a fence post, oh. not a fence post. It's like a, it's like a single pole <laughs> that you kind of use for like a fence, I guess. Uh -huh. um, but it's, it's, it's out in the middle of the yard and um, it's situated, it's close to the feeders, the other bird feeders, which can attract some unwanted attention maybe, or potentially, but like I've never really seen in my experience the past couple of years, seen a problem with it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's out there on its own. Um, it's basically in between the feeders and a tree, a silver maple tree. It's a, a decently sized tree. Um, and I would recommend against putting it directly underneath the tree, even if you have it off the trees, because much in the same way, it's like a raccoon or something could jump onto it from the you know above or something. Um, so uh -huh. I kind of have it out in the middle, like in between all these things. So my yard's my yard's pretty modest in size, but like I just kind of make do with the size I do have and. Um, yeah, I just kind of have it out there in the middle in the open. Oh. And also, uh, photo-wise, another benefit of that is the subject separation. So, like, you'll get a more blurry background if you get a photo of the bird, like, in the middle of your yard versus against a wall or something. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, in years past, I've documented, like, the family as they grew up. And um, I'll wait. I'll actually, like, just crack open my back door and just have the, <laughs> that, you know, max about 600 mil. And just have it pointing straight at it. And the great thing is, is that I have it positioned so the, the wind's not knocking into the nest box. And it's also facing away from, like, overhead sun. And the great thing is it's actually, because of both of those factors, it's um, facing towards, kind of at an angle. So I'm seeing, like, almost like a like a three-quarter pose. But it's facing from my back window. So I can have a clear view of anything, like, entering or exiting, exiting that uh, nest box, which is great. Oh, wow. So. It's a little advantage for me, and, and for the photos itself, it's great, because, yeah, you, like you said, Henry, it's like the, the distance and the separation helps out. Um, if I am taking a photograph of, like, maybe, like, the two, the, the bluebird couple perched on top of it. Uh -huh. Yeah, that, that's great to have something as cool as a bluebird as well nesting there. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's one of my favorite species, too. It's They're just such a... Um, small bird but like they have like this nice mellow song uh -huh. it's really kind of relaxing almost every time i hear it it's kind of the same way as a white throated sparrow it's like it makes me really excited too yep definitely mm. do you have any besides like those hawks do you have anything that kind of like nest regularly yeah any, so any i animals? i have a kind of a unique thing so we we have a garage um and we have this insulation in that garage because uh we have a bedroom right above it so like it always got cold in the winter, so we installed some, like, yellow, like, popcorn-looking, like, installation. Uh, so we'll have birds. If we don't shut our garage door, we will have, like, flocks – not a flock, but, like, a group of, like, ten birds fly in there and steal the insulation and start using it for their nest. Um, and they, they fly to a nearby tree. Um, and they do this every spring. Um, so we have to shut our garage doors or else we'll have, like, insulation all over the floor. Um so that that's definitely really interesting. Um, and I also remember a couple years ago we had a um, a family of sparrows or not sparrows. Um, I can't remember what it was, but we had a family of birds nest in a uh, gardening like container in our garage. Uh, like they literally nested in there and laid eggs. And it was we we had to avoid the garage for a while because they were like violent birds. Like they would flap around. And, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and we've definitely had some weird experiences with our garage and birds, but um, we also have, uh, of course, you got your robin nests. We pretty much have at least one every year. Uh, we we don't have like a big backyard or anything, but uh, there's a decent variety of trees. Um, and we'll have right now. I don't know if they have a nest, but there's a family of house finches that are kind of living around the feeder uh, they're always around like every day i see them uh, so they've been fun to photograph and observe uh, but th that's pretty much it for me yeah it's interesting about the garage because it's like it you know i imagine it opens and closes every day or you know pretty often but uh -huh. like the nest in there is just kind of interesting i think i mean like you're away from the elements like if there's high winds or storms sure yeah i mean it's <laughs> like, smart I, I just don't think it's I don't know. I just, I'm not sure if it's like viable though, because like, how would they escape to get food, which they need to do on the regular, especially when they something is fledged recently. Yeah, I mean, like, I just feel like that's tricky. Our garage is kind of 
interesting. It's like behind the house, so like people from the road can't oh, see okay. it. So we we used to before the insulation thing, we used to leave it open all the time. Um, <laughs> so it was easier for the birds to get in and out. So th- this was before the insulation, so they definitely had more of an opportunity to escape and whatnot. Oh, okay. I see. That yeah. makes more sense. Yeah, if it's like its own isolated uh, shed or building, that I feel like they'd be more apt to use it then, of course. Yeah, it's it's not like a separate building. It's kind of interesting. It's like we're on the hill, so like it's in the basement, if that makes sense. It's kind of odd, but... Oh, okay. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, that's, of course... It's pretty neat that you get that. Yeah. And then with those birds, we, uh, we did... We didn't move the nest... Um, but we just uh, eventually, once we saw that the baby birds were, you know, ready enough to move, we we didn't shoo them out, but we moved the net, we moved the bag outside one day when they weren't there, um, and they were fine. So they just lived in the yard. So all good there. Where they belong. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that must be pretty wild, though. I mean, uh-huh. <laughs> no pun intended, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever get any like other like in general do you ever get any other like non-bird wildlife or mammals uh yeah so we get quite a bit um uh, squirrels tons of squirrels uh let's see what else uh i've seen a fox in my yard pretty often actually I've never got in a photo but it, he's always around there is a fox in our neighborhood um <laughs> what else there's i've seen there's a groundhog that used to live in our yard uh, it got run over a couple years ago, but <laughs> it was there for quite a while. Um, feral cats, not like bobcats, just like house cats that have escaped, or I don't know who they belong to, but they're they're always in our yard. Uh, mice, there's a bunch of mice that live in our yard. Uh, chipmunks, actually. So uh, since we're kind of, it's kind of a weird elevation. Like our yard is raised in some parts, um, so there's like a wall. And there's tons of chipmunks living in that wall. So I always see them. Um, so that's probably the most dominant one. Like, I would say there's like 10 at least chipmunks that live in our yard. So it's always fun to watch. Jeez. <laughs> Sounds about like mine, too. Um, yeah, we have tons of chipmunks, you uh-huh. know, during the warmer parts of the year, of course. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of get just the run of the mill species. Like, you know, um, I'll talk about it a little bit, but like, I have a trail camera set up. Um, and I've captured on, you know, video and stuff like possums, raccoons, skunks, um, of oh. course, yes, tons of squirrels, like same here, just like Eastern tree squirrels mainly. Um, and every once in a while you get some deer that pass through, like maybe once a week or something, you get a couple of them, um, just making their rounds and they usually eat from like the bird feeders <laughs> and, um, drink from the, like the bird fountain or the bird bath, <laughs> you know, just normal stuff like yeah. that. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, it just depends. Um, there's always seems to be like. And nest like nesting um i guess they hibernate maybe but like i don't know too much about them but like eastern cottontail rabbits um you get like a family of those that you know they raise up the family and get all the babies and stuff in spring um and so they're always running it around the yard um but yeah other than that not too much else um for me here just typical stuff you'd see in the midwest i guess yeah i mean uh those the bunnies are interesting. I've actually never seen a bunny in my backyard for some reason. I don't know what's going on there, but it's cool that you have those. Really? Yeah. I'd, I'd say this, um, yeah, I believe it's Eastern Cottontail is like their actual, their common name, but um, they're pretty much well adapted and suited for um, suburban you know, life, I guess, you know, urban set, um, urban settings, I guess, overall. Yeah, I, I think it's because of the hills, maybe. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah, I think they just like the the well manicured like lawns and stuff, uh-huh. and like there's a slight hill that kind of raises up um, towards the back end of uh, my backyard, but like it's mainly flat, just you know mowed grass. Uh-huh. So maybe they just like that simply uh-huh. eat the clovers and stuff. I do I do want to mention uh, like wildlife wise, um, the house I'm going to be living in in Michigan this summer. Uh, there is every once in a while a black bear that shows up in the backyard. Um, it, it actually has eaten from our feeder before there, um, so that's oh, wow. that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Are you are you thinking about setting up a trail camera? Uh, I they're kind of expensive, but um, I know my grandpa who lives there has security cameras on the outside, and he's caught them on camera yeah. before. So 
<laughs> Maybe I'll get access to that footage or something. Has it seen the midday or like nighttime mainly? Uh, mostly uh, midday actually. So, <laughs> yeah. In the summer, I'll be there like, in the summer, so they'll they'll be a lot less. But uh, in the winter, you think when they're migrating, you wouldn't see them, but they're actually more common in that area in the winter. So. I'd imagine they're on the move a little bit, or they can be at least when they're not hibernating. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, they're looking for food. They're really hungry. Trying to. Yeah, they're on the move more, I'd say. But I mean, like, and all things considered, like uh, black bears are probably like, I don't want to say the the easiest to get along with, but they are a lot more shy, I'll say, than like a grizzly or polar. Yeah. So, um, like, except as long as you don't like agitate them or tall, you know. If you if know, you do agitate them, them though. Uh, I've been doing a lot of bear sure. bear research because I've gone to Yosemite. Um, but uh, I've heard that black bears can climb trees and also run faster oh, yeah. than a racehorse. So if you do agitate them, <laughs> you're screwed. But um, they're definitely calmer, I think, and smaller. So yeah, I, I feel like it's like most species, most wildlife really is like if they have their young with them, they're going to be much more territorial, which is aggressive. And if they're really, really hungry, they're gonna be more territorial and aggressive. Uh huh. So, those two main things I think. But yeah, if you if you just are smart about it, yep. and like I'm not saying you, but just in general, like if you're just smart about it and like know your limits, uh-huh. like keep your distance from it, um, have like a bear bell or whatever you need uh-huh. to keep yourself, you know, safe. Yep. Um, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. I know for Yosemite, and I'll have it up in Michigan as well. I have bear spray now, so. Uh, and that's <laughs> smart. It's guaranteed to work. Like, well, not guaranteed, but it, it works like eighty-five percent of the time. Um, and bear attacks, like it repels them. So it's definitely essential to carry that if you're in that kind of environment. Right. right. And even have one. Yeah, good. Speaking of backyard photography, like even have one in your house. It if you had to use it, I don't know. Like maybe if your dog's getting attacked or something, I don't know. <laughs> Well, I know someone that um, she lived up in Montana for like a good part of her life, and she was telling me about these like stories of just they would have bear drills, oh, legit, geez. in like in school and stuff, like because bears would just walk right into school, and like so they had these drills to like into the actual what school? to do in case. Yeah, they just walk right in. What I mean, the heck? They whatever. Whoa. Yeah, oh, yeah, there's tons, there's tons of videos, not just schools, but like they'll just walk into like an open door business and not really looking to cause trouble but i mean like it is distressing uh-huh. you just see a bear walk into your business or something Jeez. so yeah just any crazy things like that but um we're on a tangent here aren't we <laughs> but i mean it's good that you're prepared though for um, yep. your trip though upcoming trip uh-huh. yeah and hopefully this summer too i'll see one in the backyard that would definitely be cool just don't bring your wide angle if you do <laughs> yeah no. don't plan on it <laughs> Unless I want to Run do like to a it. nature scape and get him in his environment, but <laughs> all natural, uh-huh. yeah. this live bear. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, um, but do, do you... uh, up there as well. I just want to mention in that backyard, I've also seen bobcats too, which is really cool. Ooh, yeah. Now in Ohio, um, it's pretty neat, but um, I haven't seen. I've seen one at like a rehabilitation center, but like um, the only. The bobcats are really in eastern Ohio because it's much more hilly, old growth uh-huh. forest that way. I'm kind of more in the I'm southwest Ohio, so it's more like till plains and meadow, and some kind of bogs and wetlands and stuff. So like they aren't really too common around here. They've been sighted before in years past, um, but I've never like seen seen one. Yeah, like I said, besides like a rehab center. Yeah, they're I think they're a lot rarer than people think. Like especially in our region of the country. Hard- Hard, hard to find, I'll say, I think. Like, most people only see them at night, like, or even on daytime in, like, a trail camera. And it's usually in some of, like, a kind of desert, not deserted, but, like, remote area, I guess. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah, they're definitely yeah, like, not big woods people, or people, 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 persons, people, animals. I don't know. <laughs> try to say. Yeah, they, they keep away. Same, same with coyote. I've never seen them in my backyard, but they're definitely around my area. Oh, yeah, there's, there's so many night. coyotes in Ohio. It's crazy. Yeah, the population's getting bad. Like, like kind of like how we hunt deer, they keep population levels low. It's like kind of same for a coyote. People are like, there's too many of them. Like, uh-huh. they're they'll attack dogs uh-huh. if they're really are feeling it, you know, hungry or something. Yep. We Stuff need like we need more wolves, less coyotes. <laughs> or there's koi wolves too. Koi wolves. I've never. What it's is like a hybrid is or something? A hybrid. Okay. It's like a hybrid between oh, cool. the two. <laughs> huh. yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Jeez. Yeah. 
All right, let's get back on track. Okay, um, back to the backyard. Do you ever? Yeah, yeah, back to the backyard. We don't have to go far. Um, do you ever use like a wildlife blind? Do you ever like set up? I know you mentioned your bush, but like, do you ever so, do anything else? Yeah. So actually, this week, uh, well, when this podcast comes out, it would be last week. So last week, I got, I just bought a ghillie suit, um, a face mask, gloves, and then like this netting that's like camouflage. So I, I, I might try setting something up soon. Um, so, yeah, I, I haven't done it before, so I've never really had any kind of blinds before this, but I'm definitely going to try it. Uh, what about you? Hmm. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've done some, I guess you could say experimenting a little bit with just setting up one of these, like, pop-up wildlife blinds. You can buy it, like, any urban outfitters or dick sporting goods, any of those, like, outdoor recreational area stores. Um, so I put that up a few times and just tried out some backyard birds and has some great results actually, because it, it kind of just sticks out though. Like I said, cause I have mainly like a flat mode lawn for uh-huh. backyard. So like, it's just popped up right in the middle, <laughs> like a few feet away from the feeders, but I mean, it does hide me and camouflage me technically. So yeah. birds don't really pay no mind to it. Uh, I think if you, um, but other than that, I, I was yeah, just going to say, if you leave it up for a couple days before you do your shoot, they have some time to get used to it. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a great point. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's a great point. And also, like, if you go, like, if you go out early morning, get there before sunrise, so that way yes. you don't they don't uh-huh. see you come in there, so to speak. Yeah. Yep. Or even like, if your backyard allows it, or the landlord or something, <laughs> um, maybe set up like a permanent blind. Oh, like, um, yeah. And I think I think Rylan or oh yeah, host, Rylan's uh, always co-host. shooting in that. One yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, and he made it. I think it's like fully constructed, like a permanent structure, which uh-huh. is really awesome. I wish I could do something like that yeah. too. It'd be so cool. Uh-huh. I don't think you and I could but, um, build those in our backyards. I don't. I don't think. Yeah, if you know. saw the square footage, uh-huh. it's it's pretty small. Um, it's an idea, maybe someday, but like I'd probably need a bigger. Uh-huh. Your neighbors would be questioning for sure. <laughs> oh man, yeah, you surprised. Even mm-hmm. with the pop up blind, it's still like. Sticks out. It's yeah. a pretty big one too. Like you can fit a couple people in there. Uh-huh. Almost stand up tall too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a fun thing to experiment with. I even recorded a video um, last year uh, with the wildlife blind and everything. Um, so it, it's a fun little thing to mess with. I really don't do it too often because I'm much more of a uh, on the move, I guess, wildlife shooter. Uh-huh. So I don't really like to. It's just not my cup of tea, I guess, to just sit there for hours. But I have done it before, and it, it can work pretty well. Yeah, the, the some people like the precision with they have the blinds and then they'll have the the perch and they'll like put out some water and they'll some of them even are so precise that they'll use a wide angle lens and like have a blind like right up on the perch and like oh, wow. I that that type of wildlife photography is definitely really cool. It's very different from what we do, but um, I I definitely <laughs> like to experiment with it a bit more. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like you said, it's it's pretty like refreshing, I'd say, to take a shot like that because it's so different from the big telephoto kind of stuff that uh-huh. most of us are used to. Um, but yeah, I have to try that too. That, that's very interesting. Uh huh. And then I yeah. I talked about this two weeks ago, I think, but I saw this guy on YouTube who set up a his camera in his backyard, uh, like his actual camera, and used the app, like his camera app, to triggered the shutter and he put it up on a tree he mounted it up there and got some like squirrels close up with a wide angle and birds uh it, it was really cool so i want to try something like that as well that would be awesome yeah i think that's, that's the neat thing about these backyards is that you can kind of like i said make them to fit your needs and like for photography speaking you can set up these perches and stuff and just get the like the coolest photographs possible by luring in you know common backyard birds and other kind of wildlife yeah i mean you could just really learn a lot about everything nature photography <laughs> uh, i kind of want to shift the conversation a little bit to macro photography in the backyard because i think mm-hmm. that's kind of another big uh principle or big subject that you can shoot uh back there so wh- what are Definitely. your what has been your experience with that um pretty good pretty good um i'd say like Mainly because I have like a, quite a few like container plants, just stuff you can buy at the store. Um, but I've had some like, I guess you call them weeds or anything. Um, just 
it's not that it's less than desirable, but it is like a flower plant, so to speak, still. Um, and I've had like um, lots of dead nettles, uh, some daisy fleabane. Um, more recently, I had a butterweed, which it's a kind of lumped into the the ragwort family, which isn't more of an invasive weed than anything. Um, but to see that just kind of growing out of middle of nowhere is pretty awesome. So I let it grow all the way up to fully bloom and took some macro photographs of the top down, which is pretty cool. Um, other than that, just wood sorrels, uh, lots of violets in like early spring, um, you know, dandelions, I guess, in all their forms. Um, just, you know, the basic varieties of plant life, I guess. Nothing too crazy, like an orchid or anything. Um, unless if you plant like perennials or annuals, maybe. How about you? Yeah, uh, I'm not like the biggest like plant guy, uh, but you know, uh, my mom as well. Shout out to her; she's listening. Uh, she plants <laughs> a lot, so uh, a lot of uh, flowers. So uh, let's see, uh, peonies. I don't know if those are considered flowers, but those are always fun to photograph. Uh, daisies, not daisies. I'm sorry. Uh, what's the one? Dandelions. Not, well, there's some dandelions, but what's the big red ones that get really large? Oh, uh, why am I blanking? It's so common. I can't... Roses, zinnias. Well, ro- yeah, we do have some rose bushes. Uh, those are from the photograph. Uh, oh, cool, cool. Yeah, uh, those are towards the back. Like they're kind of like on a fence, which is pretty cool. Um, oh yeah. We've got tulips. That's sorry, <laughs> tulips. Uh, we got the red. And, I don't know your backyard. <laughs> yeah, we got the red and the yellow variety, so uh, it's really fun. Mm. Uh, I actually recently photographed those. Like I, I got a macro perspective, like just of the flower, so I like zoomed in and just got like the entire flower. That was fun. Um, hmm. We got, let's see, I don't know the name sadly, but it's just giant like flower, like bush like thing of pink plants uh it's really good like you can frame up one flower and then the whole background is that same flower um so that's really fun Mm. uh got different kind of mosses on the wall uh ivy you know it's just it's a fun place to photograph Uh, Hmm. that's awesome you get you get a lot of variety like i just had to bring plants introduce native plants to my yard but yeah you get like the shrubs and the brushes Uh uh-huh and bushes and everything in between that's pretty cool yeah my, my family's big in the gardening so it's it's kind of nice to <laughs> have that so yeah the way my backyard's situated um i got a crab apple tree which is a pretty decently sized moderate tree um and that's just split down the middle and there's a bird bath that's right underneath which is pretty nice because it's in the shade most you know warm and sunny days uh, for the birds to drink and bathe in um, and then I got bird feeders on both sides, um, which is pretty great. But um, in early spring, that crab apple tree turns like a vibrant pink, uh, the flowers do. Um, and that lasts about a week and a half to up to two weeks. Um, and so I'll use that as a common, um, for photography, I'll use that as a common perch for songbirds, just to get the nice pink color surrounding them and everything, which is really great. Um, and then in, in the winter and fall, um, you get lots of berries produced on that tree too, huh? um, and then that's a common food source, of course, for a lot of birds. Yeah, crab apple trees are great for sure. So dynamic, mm-hmm. and yeah, like you said, they attract animals as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think it's important to like have the food sources, the water, um, and like I said, if you can, you know, ways for them to like raise their young, or to even have them at all. That's really important. Like the three main ingredients, I would say. Of, um, this recipe that is the backyard, no matter what, how big or small you have one. Yeah. Uh, dogwood trees. I've got a couple in my yard. They're also very, uh, pretty as well. If you, you get like a nice, sorry, <laughs> you get like a nice close up perspective of the leaves and get the nice blurred out background. Uh, those could be some really great shots. Mm-hmm. Do you ever get any like butterflies or any other kind of cool, like moths or insects? Anything? You no, know, I, I don't get a lot of butterflies. I, I don't know why, but I really don't. Uh, I get hmm. a lot of bees, but, uh, you know, they're they're pretty fun <laughs> to photograph, but not much else. What about you? Um, yeah, a decent amount. Like, it's it, in terms of butterflies, it's mainly cabbage whites, which are, I would say, very common um, overall. And they'll just they'll pass through the yard, so they're not really sticking around too long to, like, take a shot, of course. But um, every once in a while, I'll see, like, a 
Monarch or Viceroy, maybe fly pretty overhead. So like I said, once again, it's just passing through. Um, but like, once again, I think it just matters about what you have in the yard. It helps. It, it's all like the knowledge and research of knowing what you have or want to have. So like, maybe you want to have a butterfly garden because you want to, of course, track, attract the uh, butterflies. And so you just get the, the proper pollinating plants or their host plants to raise them and everything. Um, so maybe that might be an idea for you if you ever wanted butterflies or even me if i want more of them because <laughs> i really don't get much either yeah that's a great idea i've i've definitely been thinking about improving the backyard and kind of optimizing it like that so thanks for the idea <laughs> oh yeah no problem yeah and it's, it's kind of it's not really the backyard but i guess it could be but like if you have like one of those like wall lights for your patio or even your front porch um especially like the humid days of late summer or mid to late summer, get lots of moths and everything, which is great too. Um, so I've learned a lot just from going outside my front door or back door and just seeing different ones that are just attracted to that light, you know, just hanging out in the walls too. Yeah. That, that's a great idea. Mm. But yeah, there's lots to see out there. Lots to see, which is great. And like I said, yeah, it just depends on what you want to see and kind of catering it towards that aspect or however many you want. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, before we finish up the show here, I just wanted to mention one more thing. Um, I feel like for me, and I know we've talked about this, but, uh, the backyard was kind of like the beginning of photography for me, really. Like I did some like in, like in my room, I would do some like set up shots, but mostly I would go out in my backyard and photograph like flowers or macro details. I feel like it's really where a lot of photographers got their start. Yeah. Am I supposed to agree with that? I mean, do you, <laughs> uh, do you have that experience? Like, <laughs> did you do a lot of backyard shooting or back then? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my bad. Yeah. Um, You're yeah, no, I I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah, I mean, that's been my experience too, honestly, is that, like I said, at my pretty much my start really with nature photography was like the backyard. Like, like I said, getting the common songbirds, um, any kind of flowers that would grow. I don't have much, but you know, it's still great as well. Um, and just kind of, yeah, like I said, just using it as practice, I guess, to kind of hone the techniques. Like you said, maybe you want to test out your new telephoto lens or something. And so you'll try it out in the backyard, of course. Uh -huh. So like, it's, like I said, just, it's always there. It's always available. And honestly, it's like, as long as you have like lots of good food, habitat and stuff like that, you're going to, you're going to get a great amount of, variety of wildlife to see pretty much all year long uh -huh. and even if you live in an apartment or something you could go to the green space or something and there's there's always something there you could do a icm or a <laughs> zoom in on a yeah. leaf or anything i mean you know mm -hmm. there's always something i'll even uh appendage onto this but um we didn't talk much about it but like nighttime stuff like i always do like i photograph the full moons in my backyard a lot just zoom all the way out to telescopic range and get some photographs oh, yeah. that way uh -huh. yeah it's, I, it's just nice and easy because like i don't like pay attention too much to like astronomy like astronomy and stuff like that but like you know if i quickly see like a day before like here's a full moon this month or something then i'll just quickly go at night and just take a few shots and make it an easy photograph i guess yeah and also like you don't have to go far for it i mean if you want to shoot the moon too like you know no better place to do it from your backyard like <laughs> great view i will say it's like yeah. if you don't want to do or, i mean that, that could be a whole other episode maybe in the future but like if you live out in the city or town or somewhere where there's lots of light pollution it might be hard to get some dark sky stuff like milky way any of that but i mean like the moon is pretty easy i'd say to yeah get a shot of get a tripod Definitely. and everything yeah i just do it hand the hand hand usually <laughs> really yeah <laughs> Oh man, I mean, I'd be pointing straight up and having to hold it steady at, in the dark too. Be pretty tough. Huh? Maybe I should use a tripod but... next. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> to each his own, I guess. Uh -huh. um, I even did a. Now I'm thinking about it. Um, I did a couple of years back actually. By now, I did like a. So I have like a little fire pit, kind of unrelated, but it like so I had to go on one summer night or something, and it illuminated that silver maple tree I have, and I did like it's kind of like a long exposure. I mean, because it wasn't night. But it got this like glowing color on this, you know, pitch black out, but like glowing color on this tree, and it looked really like ethereal and pretty cool, I think. Oh, cool! Is that the so, one you put in the slideshow? 
Yeah, yeah. I think I have a couple of them. Yeah, yeah it's really so. cool. Like, oh, thanks. It's so then, unexpected, um, too. Tried... Like, you would never know that that small of a source could produce that much light. But over time... It... Yeah, just... Yeah. <laughs> I just wait till the fire in the fire pit like grew this really large size, like a couple feet off from the pit itself, and um, and I just wait to take like a 25, 30 second exposure. Tried that. Yeah. So yeah, it worked out pretty well. It was a nice surprise. I really like the look of it. Um, you can even do like light painting with um like a headlamp. Oh yeah. Like I did that on that same tree as well. Um, yeah, I did some like just you know hit the exposure for bulb or bulb mode or do 30 seconds or something along those lines. And then I just move my head up and down with the headlamp and like illuminate the tree and use that as like the only available light source too. And I use that to focus as well because it's pretty tricky to focus in the dark. Oh yeah, definitely. So yeah, just fun things to experiment with. Um, like I said, my yard's not really the craziest, like in terms of the backdrop, because you just got all the neighbors' houses and, you know, <laughs> artificial fences and all that. But, you know, I may do, and, you know, you can still photograph the moon or do like your tree and some kind of telephoto in a way that crops out everything around it, distractions and otherwise. Yeah. Well, I but, think, uh, <laughs> unless you have anything else to add, I think that pretty much concludes oh. the episode. <laughs> I think we covered all the bases there. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. And, um, yeah, backyards are fun. So, never stop visiting them, I guess. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so, you got any announcements? Right. Ooh. Um, really, at the moment? Just still cranking out the videos, doing lots of, um, blog posts and writing on there if you want to look at that if you're interested um i do i have a couple of festivals coming up so so i'm really glad they're coming back this year so just doing that and getting nice. the, the work and everything out there more so yeah. it's gonna be great but other than that not too much else cool how about you um i've got a let's see so if i've got a video coming out or it's already out when you guys are listening to this um it's a <laughs> what's in my camera bag video. Um, so I had my gear laid out for my California trip. Um, so I decided why not uh, just do a video about the gear. I'd never done one before. So if you're interested in what I use to make my photos, uh, check out that video. It'll be in my, it's on my YouTube channel. So uh, besides that, uh, I've also of course got my big trip. It's probably the biggest trip I've taken in three years, really. Um, so I'll be hitting the Redwoods, uh, some of the California coasts with like the sea stacks and all of that. Um, and of course, Yosemite National Park. So I'll get a lot of landscapes, uh, hopefully some wildlife too. Um, I'll of course be doing recap videos on that and just all kinds of content. So, um, uh, I'm also going to be starting a TikTok as well. Uh, I'll be doing some filming <laughs> for that in Yosemite. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, and yeah, I've got a lot of big things coming as well uh, to be announced. Uh, but yeah, just stay tuned. Looking forward to all that, especially the redwoods. It's gonna be great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, can't I'm very see what you excited. Come up with there. Yeah. Yeah, you can't you can't go wrong photographing that place. No, I'm gonna get the. I know everybody takes it, but I'm gonna. I'm excited to get the shot where you look straight up at the trees with the wide angle. <laughs> very excited for that. Just one. do it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't feel bad that everyone does it. Uh -huh. Just do it. Yeah. Yeah. Can't wait to see your spin on it, I guess. <laughs> I think I'm going to do some ICMs too there. That'll be interesting. Oh, yeah, definitely the trees. Uh -huh. They're doing like an up and down motion. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. Yep. Shoot. Yeah, I'm looking forward to all that. Uh -huh. and I, my goal is also to get a bear uh, shot somewhere, hopefully in Yosemite. So it's one of my goals. Ooh. Yeah. Silhouette at sunrise or sunset. Eh, I, I want the full details. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let the opportunity come my way. <laughs> Surprise me. Yeah. Hopefully not too yeah. surprised, but yeah. Yeah. Hopefully nothing bad happens. No. I have bear spray, <laughs> so it'll be fine. There you go. Yeah. Or to your gear, yeah. I guess. You know? Um, and but one no. thing to mention, uh, sunrise is there, so I'm going to be shooting sunrise, of course, of like El Capitan and whatnot, and hiking out to locations. So sunrise there is 5:45 a.m. <laughs> So I'm going to have to get up at like 4 a.m. Um, and do sunrise hikes. And hopefully I don't get eaten by a mountain lion. I am going with people, so I'm not going alone. But uh, that'll be a challenge. Okay. I've never really done an early morning hike like that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, those, those early morning hikes, are, they can be tough on the body. But uh -huh. it does wake you up. So yeah. it's a nice part about it. And the lighting is just unmatched. 
and no one really goes out either. So oh, yeah. you have it all to yourself, I'd hope. Thank you so much for watching the Owl Outdoors Photography Podcast. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and the video version on YouTube as well. You can subscribe down below, and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you.